Okay, so they give you the best rifle in the world. So what? Me? I'm sick of monkeying around. What I want to know is, when do we get to shoot this M1? I heard a man in this company say that yesterday. And I've got a hunch a lot of you feel the same way. So, I want to answer the question now. You'll start shooting the M1 when you're ready. And that means when you've mastered the groundwork, we're teaching you in this course. You've had sighting and aiming, firing positions, trigger squeeze, and the principles of rapid fire. We've been training your eyes and your muscles for the job of shooting. And now your brains are going to get a workout. So this is a skull practice session. We'll take elevation and windage. I'm going to show you how to raise or lower your sights to take care of the natural drop of your bullet and how to move your sights right or left to allow for the effect of the wind on your bullet's path to the target. Look at the sights on your rifles. Your front sight is fixed and your rear sight is movable. It has two knobs, the windage knob to move it from side to side and the elevating knob to move it up and down. Turn these knobs. You notice that they don't rotate freely. They click as you twist them and those clicks are important. For each click, your sight moves an exact distance and that's the way you keep track of the adjustments you make. All right, let's talk about elevation first. If you've ever thrown, or hit, or caught a baseball, you know the principle of elevation. You know that no matter how fast it's traveling, a baseball keeps falling all the time it's in the air. The farther it goes, the farther and faster it falls. Exactly the same thing is true of a bullet. Well then, suppose you're firing at a target 300 yards away, and you make no allowance for the fall of the bullet. Suppose that when it leaves the muzzle of your rifle, the bullet's heading straight for the center of the bullseye. But it drops. It starts to fall as soon as it leaves your rifle, and it keeps on falling. The distance it falls in the first few yards isn't worth worrying about. But at 300 yards, your bullet will drop 20 inches or more. It'll drop right off the bullseye. You've got to tilt your rifle up a little to allow for that drop. Suppose you raise your rear sight. But you keep our old friend the correct sight picture. The line of aim must always be the same. So, setting your rear sight higher makes you tilt your rifle up. The higher your rear sight, the higher the tilt of your rifle. Do you get that? When you adjust your rear sight for elevation, you simply fix the exact amount you're going to tilt your rifle. That means how much you're going to raise or lower the hit of your bullet on the target. And since your front sight is fixed and your rear sight stays where you set it, you make precisely the same allowance for every shot you fire. And that's where the elevating knob clicks come in. As I told you, each click moves your rear sight up or down an exact distance. When you change your rear sight, then, you tilt your rifle a corresponding amount. And this moves the hit of your bullet on the target a distance in exact proportion to the movement of your rear sight. At 100 yards, one click of elevation moves the hit of your bullet on the target up or down one inch. At 200 yards, one click moves it two inches. At 300 yards, three inches. And so on. That's what the book means when it says one click of the elevating knob moves the strike of the bullet one inch on the target for each 100 yards of range. To move the head of the bullet up, raise the rear sight. To move it down, 
lower the rear sight. And that's all there is to it. Now let's see if you've got that. You're firing at this target, at 200 yards. Your first shot hits 10 inches low. What are you going to do about it? Thompson? Sir, at, at 200 yards, each click raises the bullet two inches. So you take five clicks to raise it 10 inches. Right. One more. Your range is 500. You've made too big an allowance, and your first shot strikes five inches too high. What do you do about it? Hopper. Sir, five inches at 500? You'd have to bring the rear sight down. Why, uh, just one click. Right again. Each click moves the strike of the bullet one inch for each hundred yards. You all see that? All right. Let's move on to windage. You may have heard that windage is tough, but don't let it throw you. It's no more mysterious than elevation. There may be a few more things to keep in your head, but take it easy and you won't have any trouble with it. Now you might find it hard to believe that the wind can have much effect on anything as small and fast moving as a bullet. But you can take my word for it. Any wind, unless it's coming from straight behind you or straight in front of you, is going to blow your bullet off its course. Take it as we did elevation. Suppose you're firing at 300 yards and you make no allowance for the wind. Suppose that when the bullet leaves the muzzle of your rifle, it's heading straight for the center of the bullseye. But there's a wind from your right. That wind keeps pushing your bullet to the left, forcing it off your line of sight and off the target. Once again, you've got to make an allowance. You've got to start your bullet off to the right of your line of aim, so that the force of the wind will push it over into the bullseye. In other words, you've got to point your rifle into the wind. If you were shooting an old-time squirrel rifle with fixed sights, you'd have to guess at windage correction. You'd have to sort of aim into the wind a little. Fetch a jug of corn. You can't get that dark crow that's one through the hay. You're on. Right smart wind blowing. I guess she'd take about five inches off toward the right. That's what we call taking Kentucky windage. Aiming each shot into the wind by guesswork. And if you had nothing better than a hillbilly rifle, that's what you'd have to do. But you've got an M1 rifle. And it's a different story. It's true, you have to start with a guess at the effect of the wind. And we'll show you some tricks about making your guess accurate. But with the M1, you've got a movable rear sight. And you take right windage by moving it to the right. Left windage by moving it to the left. Then when you've made your adjustment, you line up your sights on the target, taking the same sight picture you always do. But now, you're not sighting straight down along the rifle barrel. And as a result, you angle your rifle to one side. The farther to the right or left, you move your sight. The farther to the right or left, you point your rifle. Do you see that? Well then, when you adjust your sights for windage, you simply determine how much to the right or left you're going to point your rifle. Once you set your sights, they stay put. So, till the wind changes, and you have to make a different allowance, you can be sure you've got the same angle every time. How about those clicks in the windage knob? Like the clicks of elevation, each click of windage moves your rear sight right or left an exact distance. As a result, 
you angled your rifle, right or left, a corresponding amount. And that changes the strike of the bullet on the target, a distance in exact proportion to the movement of your rear sight. So it all boils down to this. One click of the windage knob moves the strike of the bullet one inch for each hundred yards of range. At 100 yards, one click to the right moves the strike of the bullet one inch to the right. At 200 yards, it moves it two inches. At 300 yards, three inches, and so on. Let's see if you understand that. Your range is 300 yards. You fire a trial shot, which strikes the target nine inches too far to the right. Which way will you move your rear sight? Right or left? Keen? Sir, you've got to move the bullet to the left. So you move your sight to the left. Correct. You move your rear sight in the direction you want to move your head. You take left windage. Now, there's an error of nine inches at 300 yards. How many clicks of left windage do we need? Find At 300 yards, well, one click moves at three inches, so you take three clicks left windage, don't you, sir? You do. Any questions? Okay. Suppose your shot hit six inches to the left of center. What would be your correction if the range were 200 yards? Paul? Sir, at 200, one click would be two inches. So it would be three clicks, right windage, to move the hit to the right. Good. Three clicks, right windage, to move the hit six inches right at 200 yards. Now, your target is at 500 yards. Your hit is 10 inches right of center. What's the correction? Murphy? Two clicks left windage, sir, because it's five inches per click for 500 yards. Excellent. Now, what about that wind you're going to allow for? How can you guess? How can you be fairly sure in advance what effect the wind is going to have on your shooting? There are some good tricks to it, and they're not hard to learn. To begin with, I don't have to tell you that there are two things about any wind that are important. One's its speed, and the other is its direction. In the Army, we always speak about wind directions by the clock system. It's simple and convenient. Imagine yourself in the middle of the face of a big clock. Directly in front of you is 12 o'clock. Then 3 o'clock to your right. And 9 o'clock to your left. 6 o'clock straight behind you. And the other hours are in between. We name a wind by the hour it's blowing from. A wind from directly in front is a 12 o'clock wind. From the right, a 3 o'clock wind. From behind, a 6 o'clock wind. And so on, around the clock. 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock wind. The Lord knows that's easy. Just remember, you're always in the middle facing 12 o'clock, and the rest's a pushover. So we come to the other important factor, the velocity or speed of a wind. We measure the speed in miles per hour, and your common sense is enough to tell you that a 10-mile wind will have twice as much effect on a bullet as a 5-mile wind from the same direction. But how are you going to figure out a wind speed? Well, the best thing to have is plenty of experience. An old-timer can just look at a wind and feel it on his face and give you a close estimate of its speed. But not many of you have the experience it takes. So, you'll just have to figure it out. You can get some help by using your eyes. Watch what the wind does to grass or trees or dust or smoke or anything else it's blowing. At first, 
That won't tell you much about the wind speed in miles per hour. But you'll be surprised how soon you'll get the feel of it. In the meantime, there are a couple of simple rules that you can use. Here's one. Take something light, like dust or a blade of grass. Toss it into the air and watch where it falls. Point with your whole arm from the shoulder at that spot. Then estimate the angle between your arm and your body. Most of you know that a right angle is 90 degrees. When you hold your arm out straight then, the angle between your arm and your body is 90 degrees. All right, I'm pointing at the spot where the grass fell. My arm is a little less than halfway up, so I'll say the angle under it is 40 degrees. Got that? If this is a 90 degree angle, this is a 40. Now then, the rule is that you divide the angle under your arm by four to get the speed of the wind in miles per hour. Don't ask me why. Somebody made it up before my time and didn't tell me why. But I know it's near enough right to work. One quarter of the angle between your arm and your body gives you the speed of the wind. All right, if this is a 40 degree angle, what's the speed of the wind? Lewis? Four into 40 is 10, sir. 10 miles per hour. Right. The angle between your arm and your body divided by four is the wind velocity in miles per hour. If my blade of grass fell there, what's the wind speed? Carol? That's a little more than halfway up, sir. About 60 degrees. Right. 60 degrees? What's the speed of the wind? Four into 60 is uh, 15, 15 miles an hour. Okay, remember that. One quarter of the angle between the arm and the body. There's another rule of thumb, or really it's the same rule applied in a different way. You take the whole angle between your body and your arm when it's straight out and divide it into five equal parts. Then each of these parts represents a wind speed of five miles per hour. You see what I mean? You toss your dust or your blade of grass or whatever it is, just as you did before, and point to the spot where it falls. Then you work it out this way. Five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour. Questions? Of course, you won't always have to work the wind out for yourself. This man's army believes in cooperation. If somebody knows the wind speed already, ask him. On the range, ask the man ahead of you. In battle, ask the next man down the line. And if anybody asks you, tell him. Only, don't tell him unless you know what you're talking about. Well, now you know how to designate wind direction and how to figure wind speed. You're able to get the information you need to set your sights for the effect of the wind. How are you going to turn this information into clicks of your windage knob? One way is to refer to windage diagrams in your scorebook. These charts work out the corrections for you and will be explained in detail by your platoon leaders. But you don't take your scorebooks into battle. In a scrap, you estimate your wind, do the figuring in your head, and set your sights but quick. So learn how to do it now, while you've still got time to think about it and get your questions answered. Ready? Hold on to your hat. Here we go. Here's the one click windage rule. Range in hundreds of yards times wind velocity in miles per hour divided by 10 equals the number of clicks of wind allowance you've got to take for three and nine o'clock winds. Now don't let that scare you. It's not as tough as it sounds. For instance, when it says the range in hundreds of yards, 
All it means is that you throw the two zeros away. When your range is 300, you'll call it a 3. 500, a 5. 200, a 2. And so on. The wind in miles per hour is what we've just been talking about. It'll turn out to be some perfectly harmless number like 8, or 12, or 18, or 20. So, relax. That whole business, the range in hundreds of yards, times the velocity of the wind in miles per hour, is going to turn out to be easier than the arithmetic you did in school when you were 10 years old. It'll be about as hard as multiplying 3 times 15. You know your range. Say it's 500 yards. Well, that's five. Your wind's from three o'clock. You estimate its speed. Say, eight miles an hour. So you've got to multiply five times eight. It's as tough as that. Five times eight is 40. And that's the first half of this problem. Now, We've got to divide by 10. If you've ever been exposed to simple decimals, you know how hard that is. You point off one place from the right. If the last digit happens to be a zero, just chuck it away. And there's your problem. You multiplied five for 500 yards times eight for eight miles per hour and you got 40. Now, we have to divide by 10. In other words, we have to knock off that last zero. And the answer was four. So four is the number of clicks of wind allowance you must take. Now, we've been talking about three and nine o'clock winds. Think of your clock again. Three and nine o'clock winds hit the bullet directly from the side. What about two, four, eight, and 10 o'clock winds. That is, the winds within one hour on each side of three and nine o'clock. These winds are not directly from one side or the other, but they're so close you don't bother about the differences. In other words, the rule holds for all winds that are generally from the side. You make no allowance at all for six and 12 o'clock winds because they do not blow the bullet out of line. So what wind does that leave us? It leaves one and five and seven and eleven o'clock winds, which are two hours away from three and nine o'clock. They strike the bullet only a glancing blow and affect it only about half as much. So for them, you take half as many clicks of windage. Here it is, all in one rule. Range in hundreds of yards times wind velocity in miles per hour divided by 10 equals the number of clicks of windage correction. Use full correction for two, three, four, eight, nine, and 10 o'clock winds. Use one half of that correction for one, five, seven, and 11 o'clock winds. Use no correction for six and 12 o'clock winds. And there it is. Now I'll do one more problem for you. Your range is 300 yards. Your wind is coming from eight o'clock. And you estimate its speed to be 12 miles an hour. That's three to begin with. Times 12 equals 36. Divided by 10, three and six tenths. Am I in trouble? I can't take six tenths of a click. What am I going to do? I'm going to take four clicks. That's the rule. 
One full click for any fraction you have left over in figuring. If your answer were two and two tenths, you take three clicks. If it were five and eight tenths, you take six. You take one full click for any fraction left over. All right. Let's see if you can work it out. Range 200 yards. Your wind's a nine o'clock wind and an estimated speed of nine miles per hour. Now, how are you going to work out the number of clicks of windage? I'll write it down, you tell me what to do. Range 200. What shall I put down? Tobin? Two, sir. Right. Your wind's from nine o'clock. You estimated speed at nine miles per hour. What do I put down? Two times nine, sir. That's 18. Right. How many clicks do you take? 18 divided by 10, that's uh, one and eight tenths, sir. Right. Now, how many clicks? Two clicks, sir. Left windage. Good. Two clicks left because a nine o'clock wind is from the left. Now, suppose the wind has been from seven o'clock instead of nine. Which windage would you take? Left or right? Macmillan. Left, sir. Seven's on the left. Correct. Tobin took two clicks for a nine o'clock wind. What would you take for a seven o'clock wind? One click, sir. Because seven's is two hours away from nine. So you take only half as much. Good. Do you all see that? Now here's another. Your range is 500 yards. Your wind's from one o'clock. And your estimated speed is 12 miles an hour. Peters. Five times 12, sir, 60. Good, you're way ahead of me. Then what? Divide 60 by 10, uh, throw away the zero, gives us six. But um, a uh, one o'clock wind takes only one half the number of clicks. So it's three clicks. Good. Which windage? Right windage, sir. That's right, you've got it. I used to teach mathematics, sir. <laughs> Well, it doesn't take a professor to do this simple figuring. Now, you're on a range, 300 yards. You win from four o'clock. Speed, 15. Clarinetti. Uh, sir, that's three times 15, that's 45, sir. Right. Three times 15 is 45. Now what? Then you divide by 10, sir, and that makes four and a half. Good. How many clicks of windage? Well, like you said, sir, a guy can't take a half a click, so they'd make five clicks, sir. Good again. Five clicks of which windage? Right, sir. Right is right. 
Now, you men seem to have this pretty straight. How about it? Any questions? Good. Only be sure to remember all this. If any questions bother you, ask them. Now we'll cover all the ground we've gone over so far. We started out with elevation. We saw that when you raise your rear sight, you have to tilt your rifle to line up properly on the target. We saw that one click of elevation moves the strike of your bullet on the target one inch for each hundred yards of range. Then we went to windage. We saw that when you move your rear sight to one side or the other, you have to angle your rifle off to the side to line up on the target. We saw that one click of windage moves the strike of the bullet one inch right or left for each hundred yards of range. We went into designating wind directions by the clock. The wind is called by the hour it comes from. I showed you the tricks of estimating your wind speed. Throw some light substance into the air and point your arm at the spot where it falls. Then figure the angle between your arm and your body. And that angle divided by four is your wind speed in miles per hour. Or divide the angle into five equal parts and say each part, as your arm is raised, represents five miles an hour wind speed. And that gave you the information you need to calculate your windage. Then we took the formula here, the one-click windage rule, and saw how it worked. I don't mind telling you that I'm mighty pleased about the way you followed it all. Elevation and windage are very important things for a rifleman to understand. But what's just as important is the fact that you didn't lose your heads. Men who keep their heads are the kind of soldiers who are making Tojo and Hitler sorry they started this fight. I don't know whether you've noticed it, but my talks to you have been one but after another. Sum up what I've said, and it's something like this. You've got to get the correct sight picture every time you aim at a target. But this correct sight picture is not enough. You've got to take the correct firing position. But the correct sight picture and the correct firing position are no good unless you squeeze your trigger with a steadily increasing pressure. But You've got to master rapid-fire principles. Learn to coordinate so that you take your position, aim, and squeeze your trigger in smooth rhythm at a fixed speed. But even then, you won't necessarily hit what you're shooting at unless you adjust your sights properly for range and wind. Today, you're ready for one more lesson and one more but. You're not ready to start shooting live ammunition until you know how to zero your rifle. Now, no two men are exactly the same. No two men aim or hold their rifles precisely alike. And when a man shoots, he does it in his own particular way. No two rifles are exactly alike either. You can't see the difference between two rifles of the same make and model. But take my word for it. No two rifles have precisely the same effect on the bullets they fire. That means that every man must adjust his rifle for its little individual peculiarities, as well as for his own. For example, your rifle may shoot a little to the right, or a little low. Now the error may be with you, or it may be with your rifle. In any event, that error has to be found for each range, and your sight adjusted so that you'll hit exactly where you aim. There's one good thing about it. Once you know your zeros, you know them for keeps. As long as you've got the same rifle, those zeros won't change. So you keep them in your scorebook and you fix them in your memory. They're your zeros. 
and you need him in your business. All right. How do you go about zeroing? In this company, you'll zero your rifle first at 200 yards. Well, I don't want you to pay any attention to the range scale on your rifle. It's not set, and it may be off a mile. Do this instead. Run your sight down as far as it'll go. Then, run it back up 10 clicks, because 10 clicks is the average 200-yard setting for all men and all M1 rifles. All right. You've taken 10 clicks elevation for your first shot. What about your windage setting for the first shot? To begin with, whatever the weather's doing, center your wind gauge. Set it so that the long lines of the index come opposite each other. And if there happens to be no wind, leave it centered. Let's see how it would work on a calm day. You've taken 10 clicks elevation for 200 yards, and your wind gauge is centered. You aim. You squeeze off your shot and call a dead center bull. And you score a four at 7 o'clock. Here. Now you've got to correct both your elevation and your windage. How much? You can tell from the dimensions of your target. At 200 yards, it'll be an A target. Your bullseye is 10 inches wide. It's 5 inches from center to the edge of the black. The 4 ring is 8 inches wide. And the 3 ring is 10 inches wide. All right. Your bullet hit here. Take the elevation error first. These lines are here to make it easier for you now. But you can do the measuring in your head. Here's your shot. Here's center. Your shot this much below center. That's five inches on the black, plus, say, not quite half of the four ring. Call it three inches. Five inches here, and three here. You're eight inches low. How many clicks of elevation to bring the strike up to dead center? Connie. At 200 yards, each click will move the strike two inches. Four clicks up to raise it eight inches, sir. Right. Now, you've already taken 10 clicks as your first setting. So when you take four more, you'll have a setting of 14 clicks. And if this should be exactly right, to bring your next shot up to center level. That would be your elevation zero for 200 yards. But remember that this is only an example. I'm showing you zeroing in its simplest terms to begin with, so you'll understand the general principle. Actually, when you go out to zero your own rifle, you'll be allowed several shots to make sure your setting is right. Your first correction may be perfect, or it may not. Your second shot will check it, and you may have to make another change for your third shot. The elevation zero for 200 yards may be more than your original 10 clicks, or it may be less. That's what you'll have to find out. Now, let's go on with the problem. Four clicks brought this strike up eight inches. But that would make your next shot hit here. That's five inches to the left on the black, plus, call it one inch in the four ring. Five plus one, six inches. You've got to move the strike of your bullet six inches to the right. How will you do it? Carol. Three clicks right, sir. Good. Three clicks of right windy. We've moved the hit four clicks, eight inches up, Three clicks, six inches to the right. There is no wind blowing, so we started with the wind gauge center. And now you have the setting that ought to make the bullet hit where it's aimed. Ought to, I said, because this is still an example. And I've simplified it to make the figuring clear. But you've got to check your own correction by firing several shots before you can be sure of your zero. Now. 
Let's see how we zero your rifle when there is a wind. You simply adjust your wind gauge to correct for the wind it's blowing. Once you've done that, you go on with your zeroing exactly as if you were on the range in a dead calm. Let's see how it works. Say you're firing at 200 yards again. So, you take 10 clicks of elevation. Now, this time, you have a 15-mile wind from 8 o'clock. You start by making an allowance for the wind. What allowance will you make? Monaghan. The range in hundreds of yards, sir. That's 2 for 200 times the wind velocity, that's 15. 2 times 15 is 30, divided by 10. Well, 30 divided by 10 is 3. So you take three clicks, sir. Three clicks left windage. Good. Three clicks left windage to take care of the wind. As a starter, you've got 10 clicks of elevation for the 200-yard range. And three clicks left windage for the 15-mile wind at 8 o'clock. You're ready for your first shot. Correct position, correct sight picture, correct trigger squeeze. To make it simple, let's say you call a center bull again. You've disked a four at four o'clock. You figure exactly as you did before. Elevation first. What's your elevation error? Field. I'd say the hit's about two inches below the bottom of the black, sir. That would be seven inches low. Right. Seven inches low. So what do you do? To raise it seven inches at 200, you'd want three and a half clicks, sir. You take four, sir. Correct. Four clicks up. But you've already got ten clicks. What does that give you? Your original ten clicks weren't enough for this rifle. You take four more, that gives you 14. So your elevation zero at 200 yards is 14 clicks, sir. Yes and no, Field. It's your elevation zero if your next shot proves that it is. But you've got to check it, and check it again. Now for windage. What's your correction? Walter. Well, sir, the, the hit's about halfway across the floor ring. That's four inches, sir. The center is about five inches in the black. Four and five, that's nine, sir. Good, nine inches. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to take left windage, sir. How much left windage to move the hit over nine inches to the left? Well, at 200 yards, takes one click to move two inches. Divide nine inches by two, that's uh, four and a half clicks. You take five clicks left, sir. Okay. Five clicks left. Now, what's your windage setting? You started with three clicks left for the wind. Now you're taking five clicks more. That's uh, eight clicks left windage, sir. Okay. Eight clicks left is your setting. Is that your zero? No, sir because three of those eight clicks are for the win, and that doesn't count in your zero. Your zero is five clicks left, sir. That's exactly it, Walters. Do you all see that? Now, suppose you know that your zero is five clicks left, and the next time you go on the firing line, you have a 15-mile wind blowing from three o'clock, so that you have to take three clicks of right windage. How will that affect your zero? Jackson. That doesn't affect your zero at all, sir. Good. Do you all see that? Your zero windage is one thing, and your windage setting is another. Now, you know your zero is five clicks left, so you set your wind gauge at five clicks left. But you've got to take three clicks right for the wind that's blowing. You start from your zero setting and make your wind adjustment. In other words, you start at five clicks left and come back from there three clicks right. What's your setting then? Five left and then three right. That's three from five, sir. Two clicks left. Fine. You make your wind adjustment from your zero setting. Who doesn't see that? Hoffman? 
I'm sorry, sir. I don't, I don't get it. All right. Take it this way. Suppose your wind gauge is centered to begin with. First, you set your zero, five clicks left. But you've got a wind from the right, and you take three clicks right to allow for it. You come back toward the center line again. What I want you to see is that you set your zero and correct from it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The elevation setting is simple. Your original 10 clicks are the average setting for 200 yards. Your first shot shows whether it's too much, too little, or just right for your rifle. You make whatever correction you need to hit exactly where you aim each shot. Check it, and that's your elevation zero. Any other questions? Let's have another problem. Another man, another rifle. We'll stick to the 200 yard range because it's clear and simple. But don't forget, you'll have to zero your rifle for 300 and 500 yards too. The figures for these other ranges are different, but the principle is exactly the same. All right? Say you have a wind from 5 o'clock, and you estimate its velocity at uh, 10 miles an hour. What wind allowance will you make? Crandon. 10 miles an hour at 5 o'clock, sir? That would be 2 for 200, times 10 for 10 miles an hour, divided by 10. So the two tens cancel, and there's two clicks right. Do you agree with that, Matthews? No, sir, because the uh, wind is from 5 o'clock, and you make only half the allowance. One click right, sir. That's it. Remember that, Crandon. Half the allowance for wind from 1, 5, 7, and 11 o'clock. Okay, the wind gauge is centered to start with. You take one click of right windage. How do you set your elevation to start with? Falcon. Ten clicks up, sir. Ten clicks up from where? First you run it all the way down, sir, then ten up. Fine, very well. You've taken one click of right windage and ten clicks of elevation for your first shot. Assume your aim and your call are perfect. Say you call a center ball. And your discs are three at 11 o'clock. What's your elevation correction, Hawkins? Looks like it's about six inches above the black, sir. So that's five inches on the black and six above. That's 11 inches. Okay, go on. Each click will bring it down two inches. So for 11 inches, I take six clicks down. That's six clicks off the 10 I started with. Six from 10 is four. Four clicks up from the bottom. You check it, and if your next shots hit where you aim them, that's your elevation zero. Good. Now the zero windage. You've taken one click of right windage to begin with. Here's the strike. Link. That's about three inches out in the four ring, sir. Eight inches from the center of the bull. Uh, four clicks right to move it eight inches right. And you've already taken one click of right windage, so? So I just take four more clicks right, and that makes five clicks right. Uh, but that's not the zero windage, sir, because the zero is the setting you need if there's no wind. The zero is four, sir. If? Oh, yes, sir. If your next shot's check it. That's it. Now, there's a time saver with your elevation zero for 200 yards. Once you've got it, and you're sure of it, you can make a permanent adjustment of your range scale for 200 yards. But let me warn you, this is a ticklish business. You're not to make this adjustment except with the authority of your platoon leader and under supervision of a non-com. For instance, in the problem we just did, you found the correct elevation for your rifle at 200 yards to be only four clicks. But that was with the imaginary rifle we were dealing with, mind you. Now, with your rifle, you may find the zero to be seven, 
12 or 15 clicks. Whatever the number is, be sure that your elevating knob is set that many clicks from the bottom. Then, loosen the screw you see there in the middle of the elevating knob. Move the scale so that it's set for 200. Tighten the screw again and be sure it's tight. If it's not, you'll lose your elevating knob. That's how you set your correct 200 yard elevation for keeps. But remember, that's for 200 yards only. You have to zero separately for 300 and 500 yards. All of your zeros are important. Let me say it again. Write them in your scorebook and learn them by heart. That scorebook can be a lot of help to you if you use it right. Look through it. If you get rusty on the elevation and windage rules, here they are, with tables and examples that show you how they work. Here are the dimensions of A and B and D targets. Here are windage diagrams too. They show the correct allowances to make for winds of various velocities all around the clock for the two, three, and 500 yard ranges. But I don't want you to get the habit of depending on the book for wind allowances. Shooting a target is only your training for the bigger job you'll be doing later. And you don't take a scorebook into combat. First of all, of course, the scorebook is for keeping track of your scores and how you made them. Turn to the rifle recording sheet. Take one that's headed 200 and 300 yards, slow fire recording sheet. And I'll go through it and show you how to use it. All right, play. Give the name of your post, camp, or station. In this case, Fort Benning. Then, today's date. The hour, wind velocity, say 10 miles from 7 o'clock. The light is bright. Weather, warm. Range, 200. And you'll do your first firing from the prone position. You'll fill in all those spaces before you go to the firing line. Okay, let's say you're ready to begin zeroing. For 200 yards, you'll start with 10 clicks of elevation. Turn your elevating knob all the way down. Then up 10 clicks. Now for windy. You've got a 10 mile wind from seven o'clock. That's two for 200 yards times 10 for the wind velocity divided by 10 which gives you two. But you only take half of that for seven o'clock, which is one. One click left windage because the seven o'clock winds from your left. Write these settings down. Position, sight picture, trigger squeeze, all correct. So, you fire your first shot. You call a center fire and immediately make a dot in the center of the little circle under call in your scorebook. The call is important. Don't forget to put it down. Now, your discs are three at eight o'clock. Enter the actual hit on the M1 target in your scorebook. Number it one because it's your first shot and you've got to keep track. Then mark the score in the value column under Val. A three. Now, adjust your sight. The chances are you won't get a perfect setting the first time, but make your correction. Use your target dimension. From the center to the edge of the bowl is five inches. Say this hit is six inches long. So you'll want three clicks more of elevation. That's your original 10 clicks and three clicks more. So 13 clicks is the elevation you'll use for your second shot. Put it down and change your setting. Now, I estimate that this hit is 12 inches to the left of center. At 200 yards, it'll take six clicks 
right. Now, you started with one click of left windage. And your corrected setting, when you've turned your wind gauge six clicks right from the one click left, will be five clicks right. Put that down in your scorebook. But you've got to check it before you can be sure. So, you fire your second shot. And again, call the center ball. But, it's a four, a two o'clock. It's one inch above the black and seven inches to the right of center. So you have to come down three clicks of elevation to bring the next hit down six inches. That's three clicks from 13. And you're back at your original 10 clicks of elevation for 200 yards. Now you've got to bring the hit seven inches to the left. That'll be four clicks left windage. Make that correction. Your setting was five clicks right. When you move four clicks left, your setting is one click right. With this new setting, see what your third shot shows. Say this time, you call a four at two o'clock. And your disc, a four, two o'clock. Well, that's fine. Your shot hit where you called it. You made your correction, and checked, and corrected again, and checked once more to make sure you were right. So now, you can write your zeros in your scorebook. Elevation zero, put down the setting you had when you hit where you aimed. Ten clicks. Zero windage is the setting you need to make your shot hit where you call it if there's no wind blowing. You took one click left windage for a 10 mile wind at seven o'clock. But your final setting, when your shot did hit where you called it, was one click right. The correction you had to make then was two clicks to the right of your wind setting. The windage you take for the wind that's blowing is not part of your zero. If the wind died down, you'd have to take off those clicks and you'd have your zero windage setting because that's the setting you need for a dead calm. Now, if there had been no wind, and your wind gauge would have been centered. So, your correction would have been two clicks to the right of center. And that's your zero windage, two clicks right. Put it down in the space provided for it, under the M1 target, two clicks right. And now you're ready to fill out your rifle recording sheet. Put down your rifle number, the ammunition lot number from the base of one of your cartridges you were using, zero elevation for 200 yards, and zero windage for 200 yards. One last word on zeroing. Make sure your call is right. And always mark it in the call circle. Call what you see the instant the rifle fires. And you'll be on your way to making a good shot. This is my last talk to you before this company goes out on the range. I've tried to give you everything I know that will help make good riflemen of you. And I hope I've made things clear. This is all stuff you're going to need later on. You're going to need it for your final examination, and you're going to need it when you go out on the range to shoot for scores. Most of all, you will need it when your training's finished and you're in the big show. Where every miss is costly. And every hit means that your country has one less enemy. <laughs>